It is well documented that the Huguenots dispersed throughout Europe, to England and even South Africa, and of course New Pelts, New York. But New Zealand? That is about as far away from France and Eastern America as one could get. I am a Huguenot descendant. My maiden name was Frere, spelt F-R-A-E-R. We live in Christchurch in the South Island of New Zealand, and in the whole of New Zealand, which has a population of four and a half million, we are the only family of this name. So what was my ancestor's journey? The search for the origins of our unusual family name of Frere was begun by my father, Jack Keith Frere, in 1967, following his retirement. Although he travelled to England with his second wife, Marion, and visited Somerset House, where the archives of the United Kingdom genealogy are kept, he failed to find any reference to the Frere name there. So, on his return to New Zealand, he talked to his uncle, Hugh Selwyn Frere, who was the only living relative from the previous generation. Hugh was born in 1894, only 13 years before my father, and was the last of 14 children. He was able to provide two small clues, the only salient facts gleaned from his father, Michael. They were, A, that Michael had been born in Avoca, Tasmania, and B, had attended Geelong Grammar School in Melbourne, Australia. These pointed us in the direction of our subsequent search. So, in March of 1980, I went with my father to Tasmania. My mother had died just four months earlier. This adventure had been planned before that happened, and I was really taking her place on this trip of discovery. Earlier the previous year, Uncle Hugh had wickedly and jokingly suggested that we would probably find Michael's name scratched on the wall of Port Arthur's penal facility in Hobart. By way of explanation, from 1833 until 1853, Port Arthur was the destination for the hardest of convicted British criminals, or those who were secondary offenders, having re-offended after their arrival in Australia. Rebellious personalities from other convict stations were also sent there. In addition, Port Arthur had some of the strictest security measures of the British penal system. It is well known that many of the said criminals were no more than unfortunates, very poor and hungry folk from rural England, who had been caught stealing perhaps a partridge from the landed gentry of the time or, driven by their poverty, had committed some minor misdemeanour. For this their punishment was harsh, banishment to the colonies. We hired a car for our time in Tasmania and our first goal was, of course, Avoca. There we found a quaint stone country church where the pews were partitioned off with little doors at the aisle end, obviously for the use of family groups. The caretaker informed us that unfortunately many of the old church records had been destroyed some time previously by a mentally sick custodian. Had we come all this way to be facing a dead end, where could we go now? Happily, we didn't come away empty-handed. We were kindly and wisely directed to continue our journey to Hobart on the southern coast of Tasmania, to the Library of Archives. Here the librarian sourced a microfiche reel with the name Frere contained somewhere on it. We sat down in front of a screen and started searching. I'm not quite sure how long we scrolled through it, but eventually up came Michael Frere's name on a convict record. Can you imagine our utter astonishment, coupled with an outburst of laughter? Was this Uncle Hugh's hunch given fact? We looked more closely to take in the details. This was no ordinary convict record for some trifling misdemeanour in England. Oh no, Michael had come by a very different route. It seemed that aged about 22, Michael had taken part in an uprising in Lower Canada in 1837. Now that was an interesting piece of history, completely unknown to us. How did he come to be living there, and what led him to fall foul of the law of the day? Uncle Hugh had died the previous June, so we were left wondering if he would have been as surprised as we were. 
or did he already know? We can never be sure. Coming from our present day family and going back, which was the easy part, we had now arrived at Michael Frere, born in USA in 1815. Then, sometime before 2008, I had discovered the Huguenot Society. I found that the Frere name was well known there, even to the Frere house still standing in historic Huguenot Street, New Pelts, New York. I sent for the Frere family history, which had been compiled over many years of research by genealogists. Starting from Hugh Frere, the patriarch, born about 1640, we arrived at a Michael Frere, born 1785 and married to Catherine G. Despite the fact that his birth date could mean he was our Michael's father, we were guessing. It was frustrating. This is where the missing link was needed to connect the two strands together. It will always remain a mystery why my father Jack Frere pronounced the name Freya, two syllables. No other members of the family did. Thelma, Jack's sister, and his uncle Hugh Frere, and his family all pronounced it the phonetic way of its origins, that of Frere, one syllable, the French word for brother. I was not aware of this aberration until I began to research deeper into the family's history, by which time, 1985, my father had passed on. Understandably, it was imperative to dig into the historical records to learn more about this uprising, but I will leave details about this for later, where it fits into the amazing story. I am Gwyn, Lindley's youngest son, and I became seriously interested in the Freer family history and our quest, even naming the last of my five children Matthew Freer Clark. When opportunities arose, both my mother and I added to the mix of facts, but only on the relatively simple journey from our family back to Michael. Searching past history in New Zealand was comparatively uncomplicated. We still couldn't establish his parentage though. We did find out that Michael was born in a little town called Clay in Onondaga County in New York State. We were directed to Archives, Ontario, Canada and could have ordered at a cost five microfiche reels to be sent out to New Zealand. However, the reference to Michael's name being somewhere on each of these reels meant perhaps hours of searching through them. Neither did we have any idea how big the files were. We would have had to use our local library or that of the Latter Day Saints to access a machine on which to read the files. We also had no guarantee that, after all the effort, the references would be significant. So there it was left. On Tuesday, September the 16th, 2014, I received an invitation to the gathering of Huguenot descendants, which was to take place over the weekend of the 9th to 11th of October in New Paltz, New York. Initially, despite my spontaneous enthusiasm to be there, my husband Ian's practical nature was cool on the idea. However, everyone with whom I shared the news in the next four days was so positive it would be a trip of a lifetime, eventually Ian gave me his blessing. When I then mentioned my plans to Gwyn the following day, I caught his excitement and didn't hesitate to suggest that he come with me. It was agreed. At such short notice, it was a rush to finalise our travel plans, but most difficult of all to find accommodation. Through my music teaching connections with the family of the pastor of the Reformed Church in my home city of Christchurch, I thought to check on the internet for churches in New Pelts and found the same church there. Members of this church organised for us to be billeted with Tom Nyquist, a former mayor of New Pelts and his wife Corinne. He just happened to live on Huguenot Street, a short walk to all the gathering events. To actually see the Frere House lost last in the little enclave on the historical village was so amazing. We were able to physically put our hand on the doorway of the house and walk through its interior, though much altered from the original. We learned of other Huguenot families and explored their houses. Deo, Dubois, Lefebvre, Bevier and Hasbrook. 
Naturally, everyone was so very curious as to how we could be connected from so far away as New Zealand, and we enjoyed sharing our unique story. With the impetus, this experience gave our history gathering skills, and an hour in the library at Huguenot Street with Joan Kelly, the genealogist I had contacted six years previously, what a surprise that was, Gwyn and I returned home to very quickly complete the lineage back 13 generations. The last piece of the jigsaw was provided by email from one of our Freer family living in Michigan, a descendant of Sarah, sister to our convict Michael. This was the letter we would have hoped to have found had we sourced the microfiche reels from Canada. Its appearance and the certainty it provided was cause for much excitement and celebration. As the records of the history of the Huguenots are well documented and known to the listeners of this, I will concentrate on where our family fits into this amazing history. So we begin with Hugo Frere Senior, the Patriarch. He was the husband of two wives, the first, Marie de la Haye, having preceded him in death. She, together with their two daughters, Marie and Sarah, succumbed to the Black Plague in 1666. Their only son, Hugo Jr., survived. Hugo Frere Sr. then married Jean Vibal. He fathered 11 more children, three of whom were known to have preceded him in death. Hugo Sr. and Jean Vibal's offspring were Abraham Frere, who died within a year of birth, Abraham Frere, the second son of this name, who married Angie Wilhelm Tietzort in 1694. Isaac Frere, who married Maritier Deyou about 1692. Marie Frere, the second daughter of this name, who married Louis Fiel in about 1696. Jacob Frere, who married Antje van Weyen in 1705. Joseph Frere, who probably preceded his father Hugo Frere in death, as the exact date is unknown. Jean Frere, who married Rebecca van Wagenen in about 1705. And Sarah Frere, the second daughter of this name, who married Tuni Clausen van Volgen in about 1705. On the 4th of January 1698, Hugo Frere Sr., the patentee, native of France, early settler of New Paltz, Ulster County, New York, died and was buried in the Walloon Cemetery of New Paltz. Hugo Frere Sr. helped to organise and settle the community at New Paltz. He also assisted in organising a French Protestant church there and served as a deacon of this church for 10 years as well as an elder of this church. The following is the relevant lineage for our family for the next five generations. Hugo Frere Jr. married Marie Anne Leroy in 1690. They had 14 children. The third child, Simon, born in 1695, married Marie Tien van Bommel in 1720. They had 10 children. Their eighth child, Jacobus, born in 1735, married Antoinette Louis of Poughkeepsie in 1755 and they had eight children. They named their second child Simon, born 1760. Simon married Saletti Parmatier in 1782 and they had three children. Their second child was Michael, born 1785. He married Catherine G. There are three Michaels in succeeding generations from here on, so to prevent confusion, let us call them one, two, and three. Michael and Catherine had James, born in 1805, Sarah, 1809, and Michael II, 1815, and lived in Clay, Onondaga County. Research is still being done on the probable additional births of four more children, Hannah, 8th of September 1819, Peter 1820, Elizabeth 1824, and Nathan 1827. Michael I died in 1831, leaving the widowed Catherine to travel to Simcoe, Canada. 
Michael II took part in the rebellions, two armed uprisings in Lower and Upper Canada in 1837 and 1838. Both rebellions were motivated by frustrations with political reform. Now we have reached the point at which my father and I began to correlate the facts and ancestry from the rebellion down to the present day. So we can now learn how Michael II fell foul of the law and how the journey to Australia and New Zealand followed.